So I asked my son a few weeks ago what his favorite class in school was. Now, those of you who have spoken to my son might have some thoughts or opinions about what his favorite class in school might be. You might think that it might be math because he loves numbers, but it wasn't math. You might think that perhaps because of his love of all curiosities surrounding the earth and creatures that it might be something to do with science. And there again, you would be wrong. Surprisingly, or not surprisingly, my son's favorite class, without a moment's hesitation, he said, was strength and conditioning. What is strength and conditioning, you might ask? Strength and conditioning is a fancy word for P.E. <laughs> it is a fancy word for Jim. And one of the things that he loves to do in strength and conditioning is he loves to run. Now you see, now you see. For if you have seen my son, you have not seen my son in this church. You have seen a blur come around. And he has always been that way, and he has probably knocked over countless little old ladies in his time at churches since he has been born. I have apologized more for that than I can possibly, possibly care to tell you. And he told me that a few weeks ago uh, that he had run a mile in six minutes and 40 seconds. It was the best in his grade. And so he had some friends that... Um, challenged him, and they ran uh, a mile in six minutes and 39 seconds, and then six minutes and 37 seconds, and so he ran a mile in six minutes and nine seconds. He told me, Dad, he said, it's the best in seventh grade. He said, I could do competitive running if I could get it down to about five minutes and 40 seconds. And I would not doubt that if he wanted to be the next Usain Bolt, that he could be. It is something I think uh, that is almost inherent, almost a part of the genetic makeup of little boys that they all inherently want to be able to run and to run fast, right? There is a desire to get from point A to point B as quickly as possible. And while those of us who might be a little more mature in age, we're not necessarily more mature when it comes to running. Because even though we no longer engage in physical running, there is a lot of spiritual running that we engage in on a daily and a weekly and a yearly basis. You ask yourself, what have I been running from this year? What are the things that have kept me in fear that on the one hand immobilize me, but on the other cause me to run away from it in any other counter direction, up, down, north, south, east, west, away from that fear? because there are doubtless conflicts in your life. There are people for whom you hate to have that discussion with, and you have avoided it at all cost. And yet, God is really good when it comes to running. Because as fast as we are, six minutes and nine seconds or less, to get from here to the other side of Benbrook, God is faster. And before we even get there, God is already there. How many of us would admit, if we're honest, you don't have to raise your hand. I know what that confession publicly can look like. But how many would admit in our hearts that maybe it isn't that we are afraid and running from people, but that we are afraid and running from God? 
Not that we don't love God, not that we don't know God, not that we don't believe God, not that we don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, but when it is that God is asking us to do something and God is compelling us and saying, I need you to go here, I need you to do this, you go, look over there, God. <laughs> How many of us want to run in the other direction? away from what God has called us to do because it is the very quintessential essence of every fiber and being in our body, everything that we don't want to do is exactly what we feel God has called us to do. Isn't it funny how God works like that? The very thing we think we are the least equipped to do is the thing that God has called us sometimes to do the most. There's a scripture passage I want to look at today, and it's in this little book. It's one of the minor prophets, Jonah. You may have heard of this kid. And in Jonah chapter 1 and uh, just chapter 1, I want to read to you from there. And if you're looking to try and find it in the Old Testament, it's after Psalms. Let's just go with that. That's the easiest way. Psalms and keep on flipping. Jonah, Micah, Nahum, right there near about the middle of the Minor Prophets. Hear now these words from Jonah, chapter one, starting with verse one. Now, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittah, Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board and to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. And such a mighty storm came upon the sea that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried to his God. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hold of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. The captain came and said to him, What are you doing sound asleep? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps the God will spare us a thought so that we do not perish. The sailors said to one another, come, let us cast lots, so that we may know on whose account this calamity has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us why this calamity has come upon us. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? Who are you? What is your country, and of what people are you? He said, I am Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were even more afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them so. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea was growing more and more tempestuous. Love that one. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great storm has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hand hard and hard to bring the ship back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more stormy against them. Then they cried out to the Lord, please, O Lord, we pray, do not let us perish on account of this man's life. Do not make us guilty of innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done it as it pleased you. So they picked Jonah up and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord even more, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. But the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is the word of the Lord for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. 
Sweet Holy Spirit, I pray that you would be present in this place in all that we gather up before you and all that we do in the ways in which we run away from you, that you would hold us here, Holy Spirit, in this moment, that you would speak to us, that we would not be able to leave this place without a word of encouragement, a word of hope, a word of compassion, a word of victory, your word in our heart, in our spirit, in our life. Indeed, may my words not be my own, but may they be yours. May my mind not be my own, but may it be yours. Most of all, sweet Holy Spirit, may my heart not be my own, but may it be wholly thine, broken and open and honest before these people of God. Amen. So, here we have the best runner of all time, Jonah. Jonah is one who knows Jesus, knows, I'm sorry, knows God. We won't go to Jesus just yet. But one who knows God, one who arguably uh, knows and understands what it is to follow after God. And yet, at the same time when God asks him to show up and to do something, that is the moment in which he says, I, I can't. And we're not exactly afforded the reasons why he protests. We don't know why it is that he says no, but we do know that even though he does not say it with his words, he says it with his actions. He says it with his feet. A lot of times we don't necessarily say no to God with our words. We don't necessarily say no to God directly, but indirectly we walk or we run the other way from whatever it is that God has called us to do. But folks, let me tell you, whatever it is that God has called you to do, God has equipped you to do and to do far better than you could possibly ask or imagine. This scripture says that he goes down to Joppa, he hires a boat, he decides to go to Tarshish. Tarshish is, by scholars' account, most scholars' account, on the western, uh, southwestern part of Spain. It is on the other side of the Mediterranean Sea. It is 2,500 meters, kilometers, miles, I don't know, 2,500 something, a long ways away from where Jonah is. And more importantly than a long distance away, it is the opposite of where God has asked him to go. Nineveh is north of Joppa. Nineveh is north, and it is probably a few days' walk at the best. And it is a massive city. One can understand maybe how Jonah had hesitation. It doesn't say that this was the reason, but one can understand that no one in their right mind would want to go and preach to 100,000 people, for that is the size of the city of Nineveh. It is three days' walk across. It was a lot for anyone to take in, and yet that is where God has asked Jonah to go. He goes in the opposite direction, and as he goes in the opposite direction, that is when the trouble arises. If you notice that, the more and more you protest God, the more and more it seems as if those impediments come upon you, and the further and further you run, the harder and harder it gets, and the sea is rocking and the boat is knocking and everything is up in the air and there are people there in that boat, mariners, the scripture says, those who were trained to travel this sea and yet even they are at a point where they are afraid. And because they are at a place where they are afraid, they try and figure out what's going on. You know what? Why don't we do this thing, which is to them perhaps a little more than superstition. Why don't we offer sacrifices to our various gods? And so they throw up whatever kind of sacrifices they can offer, all to no avail. And then all of a sudden they go, oh yeah, there's that guy who's on the ship with us who commissioned us to go all the way to Tarshish. There's that guy who stowed away in the belly of this beast of a boat. There's this guy down there, and guess what? 
he's sleeping through all of this. He has tried to sleep his way away from what God has called him to do. Any of you who at any point in time have struggled with depression understand what it is to try and sleep your way out of a situation that God has called you to do. And Jonah is here and he is there in the bottom of the boat and he just wants to get away from God. He just wants to get away from Nineveh because if he can get far enough away from these people and far enough away from this obligation, then surely God will send someone else. And there are times in scripture where God does send someone else. But you know what? God has no desire to send someone else. And yet Jonah is fed up. They wake him up. Fine, I'll get up. We got to cast lots. Fine, I'll do your silly little tradition. Oh, by the way, you cast, it's your straw. It's you. Tell us what's up. Yeah, I happen to know this God. He's only like the God of all of heaven and earth. He's only like the God over all your gods. He only controls like the land and the sea and everything within it. (gasps) It's you. It's you, they say. You are the one to blame. All right, throw me overboard. Sacrifice me. He's like, what else do I have left in life? If I can just go and I can drown, then I can be rid of this obligation. And they hesitate at first. But finally, when they realize they have no other option, they throw Jonah overboard. And in the minute that they throw, in the second that they throw Jonah overboard, it says the seas quit, they're raging, they calm, everything is quiet. In that moment where Jonah has been sacrificed, the seas quit and are still. But we're still left with another problem. If Jonah drowns, he doesn't really get all the way to Nineveh, and the boat is going to Tarshish. It's going the other way, and the mariners have no desire to keep him on the boat, for he is what has caused their problem in the first place. And so there is something very convenient that is lurking in the water. Something very convenient that will travel, arguably, even faster than a ship. It happens to be a big fish. Now, some people would say, it is much larger than a big fish. It never says it is a whale. You all who have studied know, oh, that is a bit of a whale of a tail, but it is a large fish. And there was a fear of large fish. That is something that mariners had because what lurked in the depth were sea monsters. And so Jonah has gone from trying to run away to God to now being in the belly of a beast. And as if it wasn't bad enough before, now he's got some stinky old whatever that he's there in the midst of digesting along with him. Sometimes I think of Pinocchio, you know, the Disney classic, but it's probably much more wretched than that. Regardless of that, he's in this sea monster, this this giant fish, and he is takes three days to get him to land, to spit him out in Nineveh. And in the process, he prays to God, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry I've tried to run the other way. I'm really, really sorry about this. I'm sorry. And so God says, I know. And then he spits him out on dry land. And then something miraculous happens. Jonah goes through that city of 100,000 people, again, over the course of three days, and he has the biggest Billy Graham revival you have ever seen. 100,000 people saved, three days, time. It's great. And all these people get saved. And all this wonderful stuff happens to everyone else. And then Jonah is recovering from it all. The scripture says he is sitting under a tree. And we look in chapter four. It says, 
when, at the end of chapter 3, it says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. See, that's the deal with prophets. They have uh, a dual function. They have one of two roles, and that's it. What you do is you preach doom and gloom. If you don't do what God is telling me to tell you to do, if you don't ship up and shape right, calamity ensues. But if you do, God will take mercy upon you. And so they do, and God has mercy upon them. The scripture says God changed his mind. And then something remarkable happens at the start of four. It says, but this was very displeasing to Jonah and he became angry. He paid, prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you were gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and ready to relent from punishing. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah goes outside of the city, underneath the tree, and sulks. Lord has a bush that comes, it grows, it dies. All of this happens. Verse 9, but God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor and which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 100, I'm sorry, and 20,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals. And that's where it ends. We're left to wonder, is this a story about the saving of all those people in Nineveh? Or is this a story about Jonah? Is it a story about the saving of 120,000 people? Or is it a story about the saving of one? See, I would... I would posit that it's more about the one that gets saved than the hundred that are left behind. I would posit it's more about Jonah himself who is in need of more than a pep talk, but a reality check that God can work through him to do immeasurably more than he could ever ask or imagine. How many times do we think that we have our life figured out when really it's just this close to being completely out of control? But only when it goes completely out of control do we understand the one who has it in his hands. Jonah does all this and you think he would be happy that Nineveh is saved, but he's angry. And we're left with a question. When God calls us to do something, and then God shows up, do we get angry because some people did it differently than us? That some people didn't have to go through the torture and all the voyages and all of the heartache and being thrown overboard and almost drowned and almost swallowed up by a beast and almost digested through its gut and spit out on the dry land, do we find ourselves angry because of all the things that it felt like God made us do? Or are we joyful? Because even in our sometimes failed state, God has still managed to use us for God's glory. You don't get to pick oftentimes the journey that you get to go on. But you do get to pick the God that you go with. And because of that, I want the one who's going to take me from wherever I am and put me wherever I need to be so that he may call me to do whatever he has called me to do. And I hope you feel the same. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Receive now this benediction. May you go forth from this place 
no longer seeking to run away from God, but to run toward that which he has called you and that which he has created you for. Lord, you are there for the work of saving souls and you are there for the work of saving us. Be with us and help us to run headlong and footstrong and heartlong into you. In Jesus' name.